But let me now turn to part four of my remarks on how will, what, what do other countries think. And the key point I want to make here is that unlike the Cold War uh, between United States and Soviet Union, uh, as you know, that lasted a long time from 40 years or so, from 1949 to 1989 or so. In that period, when the United States had a contest against the Soviet Union, many countries enthusiastically rushed to join the American side. So the European countries joined uh, the American side against the Soviet Union, uh, Japan and South Korea joined the United States against Soviet Union. I can tell you this, by the way, I don't know how many of you know this, but even major third world countries like uh, Egypt, uh, like Turkey, uh, like Pakistan, and even Indonesia, in some ways, uh, was on the American side uh, in the contest against the Soviet Union. So there are lots of countries saying, hey, America, we are with you. But what is interesting is that in this contest between the United States and China, virtually no country in the world, except maybe Australia, okay, the current Australian government, is the only one I think that is sort of more or less behaving like the deputy sheriff of the United States, to quote the former Australian prime minister. Uh, but everybody else is saying, we want to have good ties with the United States. We want to have good ties with China. And so that makes it much harder for the United States. And that's why you notice that the first thing that uh, uh, Joe Biden has done since he became president, he's trying to get more and more of the allies to take the America side against China. So he started with the G7 countries. And as you know, at the recent G7 meeting in the United Kingdom, there was a G7 statement that contained some criticisms of China. But I'm told that while publicly the G7 showed unity towards China, privately, many of the European countries told the United States you know, we want to have, big, have good ties with the United States, but we want to have good ties with China. So take a country like Germany, for example. And Germany is important because Germany is now the fourth or fifth largest uh, economy in the world. And the Germans today, uh, the Germans used to sell more cars in America before and less cars in China. But today the Germans sell more cars in China then they do sell cars in, uh, uh, in the United States. So one in three Volkswagen cars are sold in China. One in four BMWs sold in China. One in four Mercedes-Benz sold in China. One in four Audi sold in China. <laughs> so you don't expect the Germans to give up their biggest market. And that's why I gave you the statistic earlier. Remember I told you about the retail goods market? how the retail goods market has gone up from 1.8 trillion to 6 trillion in China. And that, that's the world's biggest market for cars also. So you don't expect the Germans to give up their biggest market for cars just, uh, just because of the United States. And so it's not going to be so easy. So most countries are going to play a hedging bet. But here, the most important point I want to emphasize especially for the 10 ASEAN countries, as you know, the ASEAN countries, by the way, the most important statistic you need to know about ASEAN countries is that in the year 2000, ASEAN countries trade with United States was $130 billion, right? And so uh, our trade with uh, China was only $40 billion. So ASEAN's trade with United States was three times more than three times than with China in 20, 2000. By 2020, U.S. trade with uh, U.S. had gone up, ASEAN's trade with the United States had gone up significantly from 130 billion to 300 billion. So it went up a lot, three times. But ASEAN's trade with China went from 40 billion to almost 700 billion. <laughs> more than doubled our trade with the United States. So again, how do you expect the ASEAN countries to try a containment policy on their biggest uh, trading partner, which is China? 
And by the way, I, I, one other surprising statistic that you should know, everybody thinks that China's number one trading partner must be either the European Union or United States, because the United States and European Union are much bigger economies than ASEAN uh, is. But surprisingly, China now does more trade with ASEAN than it does with the European Union or with the uh, United States. And therefore, the ASEAN-China relationship is very, very important. And that's why it's very important for ASEAN to speak with a united voice and tell both China and United States, we, we, we say, United States, we love you. We want to have good ties with you. But at the same time, United States, you should know that we love China. We also want to trade with China. <laughs> so you don't ask us to choose. And I think that's the big message. And I think if ASEAN can send a united message to both countries, that's the best way of protecting ourselves. And I think in the case of Indonesia, I think here is an opportunity. You know, we were discussing the implications for Indonesia. Here's an opportunity for Indonesia to exercise leadership of ASEAN. As you know, Indonesia is by far the biggest member of ASEAN. Your population is much bigger than any other ASEAN country. And so I think Indonesia, the rest of other ASEAN countries would be very happy to see leadership from Indonesia in this area. And I hope that the Gorka Institute will also discuss uh, how Indonesia can provide greater leadership of ASEAN. Because if you can hold ASEAN together, uh, in the, especially in the next 10 years, then that is our best protection against the US-China uh, geopolitical contest.